Okay, I I didn't stay long at Old Mick's house because uh, my I didn't want to get the social welfare because you couldn't get social welfare back then because they'd send you straight to a job. So nobody got social welfare. <laughs> so it was so easy to get a job. So I left Mick's place after a few weeks because I uh, didn't want to pay my share of the rent. And I'd sneak into Chevrolet's Hotel. It was near King's Cross Park uh, or the Astoria Hotel. Uh, you could enter many hotels in King's Cross because they had no one on the desk at, most of the time because people paid the rent weekly. Chevrolet's was a huge rambling old mansion converted into small and large rooms rented by hookers and artists and writers and hippies with money. The rooms were cheap and elegant, but everybody looked in the know. And I came out of a bathroom, combing my wet hair, using fingers. My shirt was wet. And a girl asked, why is your shirt wet, honey? I said, I had a shower and I had no towel, so I used my shirt. She smiled and was beautiful. Need a comb? Yes, please. She sashayed down a corridor to room 16 and knocked a bebop rhythm. That's so it's, she knows it's me and not the fuzz. Cool, says I. The door was opened slowly by a pretty girl with long dark curls all the way down her back, dressed in a silk dressing gown or satin. It might have been satin. I think it was silk, though. Yeah, she mumbled that she was going back to sleep and wanted to be woken at 11 p.m. The room smelt of perfumed talc. The girl I'd met in the hall said her name was Lady George, and I said, my name's Casbah. And the next room girl yelled out, yeah, and I'm Marcia, now shut up, I've got to sleep. I sat on a chair hoping that uh, Lady George would not speak. Uh, and caused Marcia to yell for me to leave this feminine place. Lady George said, Marcia's from Adelaide. She's a dancer at the disco. We've been on speed. This morning she freaked out and thought everybody was a copper. I went and got some chloral hydrate to bring her down. She'll be cool when she wakes up. Do you use... I'd not been aware. I'd come straight from Adelaide, the church, the city of churches, and I'd not been aware that people took drugs for pleasure. And I was 21 years old, <laughs> 1966. Uh, I'd seen pot and methadrine tablets, methamphetamine tablets, being shared at, at the hippie pub, but I was ignorant of the dope scene. I thought that any drug made you an immediate addict. I'd read a book on yoga and I wanted to stay pure. And I explained to George, Buddhism doesn't preach to anyone unless they ask. And she said to me, could you go buy me a packet of meds? Here's the money. Meds were Australian tampons. Here's the money, she said. It should be enough. Hurry, love. I'll need them soon. And I made up a poem. I said, have a smoke a hash. Give yourself a pash. Trust me with your cash. I'll do a quick dash. Be back in a flash with a stash for your gash. She looked stunned, but I saw her smiling as I left outside, not even realising that I'd just invented rap. I ran full speed to the nearest chemist, but shops were closed on Sundays. And I raced to a couple more, but, uh, oh, fuck, I thought, jeez, I'm hungry. Maybe I could buy a couple of bread rolls and still have enough for a packet of tampons. So I got the, uh, the tampons from a, 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 a chemist at Taylor Square. Uh, called uh, Sharps, Sharps Chemist. That was the only one open on Sundays in all of Sydney, just about. And I came in with the bread rolls and she said, you couldn't get me tampons, so you got me bread rolls instead? 
I said, no, 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 I got some, I got some tampons here. <laughs> and we both laughed. Later we watched TV. It was a luxury to sit in a hotel room drinking coffee with a gorgeous honey. If I could get this girl to like me, I'd gain a nice house to live in. And more importantly, a girlfriend. I was in heaven as we smoked tailor-made cigarettes and we watched Hancock's Half Hour, the TV show <laughs> with Tony Hancock that we both liked. But then we got to we had to choose the a, a movie, a midday movie, and we got the TV Times magazine and we looked in the TV Times and. There were three channels in Sydney back then and they all had movies at midday. And we both chose to watch The Day the Earth Caught Fire. <clears throat> the fact that we both chose it was a sign we were compatible and destined to become lovers. I got into a position where I could slip my arm around her shoulders. But then a toilet flushed and Marcia came out, hair cascading down her back, all the way down to her hips. And she, a dressing gown hung open, but I was too hip to ogle a woman's body like a square. She sips George's coffee and she said, Ah, oh, I just had a dream. I dreamed I was on the toilet at the Beatles' house. A rolling stone knocked on the door and I tried to hurry because I didn't want him to be angry but I turned into my own turd and I was flushed through sewer pipes that turned into a long, twisted, slippery dip funfair ride. Brian Jones's bum came through the roof but I knew I'd come out of my own bum and not his. I floated in the pipes trying not to get lost some other turds were yelling that they were lost. So I looked for a roll of string to leave a trail. But then I woke up bursting for a pee, a piss. George said, Lady George said, wow, far out, and began to explain the symbolism of the dream. But I cut in, I said, those pipes were the psychic tunnel between now and your future. You weren't drowned, so you're healthy and confident. You were brave enough to enjoy it, but not secure enough to create your own pipe. You had to travel through the Beatles' pipes. They represent God in your mind. Groovy God, says Marcia, and she jumped up and said, I must get to the club. She put on makeup and she brushed her hair and George told her about my bread roll, tampon. And Marcia joked, Casper. They're always calling me Casper instead of Kaz. Casper, you silly duffy, you can't use bread rolls. They dissolve too fast. You've got to toast them and wrap them in a tea towel. It's hard to get them in position. And she mimed the act and we laughed. <laughs> until George started saying, oh, you've got to cover it with dear old Granny's cooking fat that she collected in a bucket to send to the poor pommies during the war. And impressed by this uninhibited female humour, I added, that's why the band, the Imperials, recorded I Ran All The Way Home. They thought about it for a while and got the image <laughs> These girls were so hip. Being with these super female entities was something I hoped would last forever. Marcia was ready to leave for her go-go dancing job. She looked divine in a mini skirt. And she could have been any age from 13 to 25. And then Lady George took my hand. Kaz, it's a gas to meet you but my boyfriend's coming and we're going to the Whiskey A Go Go, so i got to ask you to split. My heart sank into Disappointment Creek and hope of staying in this sugar shack vanished. 
Pretending I was not disappointed, I said farewell and walked into the street. I ran into Lady George again years later when she was on holiday from Queensland, and her real name was Lady George, but when she heard that I was writing this book, she told me to change her name to Sky. It doesn't matter much, but I think she's passed on by now. And Marcia, sweet little Marcia, was a beloved m member of the uh, Sydney Hippies, and I saw her again later in Melbourne in the 70s. And in 2000, I heard she died on the hippie beach at Darwin. Okay, that's about it for today. Oh, no, no. Wait, wait, I, there was a guy called Bourge, Bourgeois because he dressed like a real square that used to hang around King's Cross Park. And he seemed like a lonely guy, so I used to talk to him every time I, sit, I was sitting in a park. And we used to walk together to the Wayside Chapel. The Wayside Chapel was run by a Protestant church and hippies and nice folk had worked voluntarily to build it. It's still running as a charity today. But in 1966, the coffee shop was upstairs and anybody could find empathy but no alcohol or drugs. To me, it was a place to make friends and bludge food. You were welcome even if you never spent any money. Downstairs was a theatre where I joined a group getting free acting lessons. I should have paid more attention to the acting lessons, but I was not yet confident enough to really open up. Many nights I spent in that wonderful coffee shop high on nothing but my companions. After all the lonesome searching, I was a part of something. And looking back, I realised how much pride I took in being cool, C-O-O-L. That meant, one, never let any situation take me by surprise and to appear unaffected by my surroundings. Two, never allow any unpleasant occurrence to traumatise me. Three, Never be mind blown by the weirdness of others. Four, never be predictable. Five, try to avoid nine to five work. Six, sleep a lot to store up energy in case one day I needed a huge amount. Seven, was try and talk the way that Bob Dylan sang. Eight, allow Zen Buddhism to guide me. Nine, treat wherever I was as home, and I don't think there was a number 10. Yeah. Old Mick and his gang were evicted from the Brougham Street house when the land agent found that there were too many people occupying the premises, and they moved down to 253 Forbes Street, on a street level, and that's when I got a room there. I don't know how I got the money to rent a room. I think old Mick put me up at first, but eventually I, I, I paid 10 bucks a week for a room there, I think. And on the street level lived an old European landlord with an accent. He collected the rent and never stuck his nose into anyone's business unless you were a woman. Other rooms were rented to Old Mick and Three-Fingered Rick. He had three fingers on his hand. He must have lost a couple. And Eric Nolan, who'd gone on a TV talent show called Stairway to the Stars. He was billed as the Spanish Beatle. He'd sung a Beatles song in Spanish. Eric was very good looking and had a lot of chicks visit him. In 2012, I saw him in the street. He was still alive, but he had a bad limp and talked like an insane person. Uh, my room was on the ground floor and it cost uh, 10 bucks a week. Every few nights, one or two hippies would crash on my floor. Anyone with a disability had it made into an adjective, whether they liked it or not. 
three-fingered Rick looked like a bearded gnome and played bongos with a power that no one could match. Uh, other rooms were shared by Twitch and Spaz. One twitched and the other had facial spasms. They did not go out much. In Melbourne, they saved a girl from overdosing on chemist shop robbery cocaine. They took her to hospital and returned to her room and got stuck into her supply. Two days later, the girl and a gangster friend came home to find their stash was gone. Fearing retribution, Twitch and Spasm ran to the Melbourne uh, Interstate train station and jumped on the first train going north to Sydney. If anyone mentioned Melbourne or Coke in their presence, they would Twitch and Spasm. On the top floor lived Andrew Van Gannep. He was known as Dutch Andy. Dutch looked like the bearded Jesus is painted by the old masters and was sent $40 a month from his family in Holland on the condition that he never return to Holland. He drank a lot. When in his cups, he'd give an excellent imitation of Adolf Hitler. This did not endear him to the sensitive but once they got to understand he was not a real fascist, his Hitler act became an unexpected party piece. Well, it was an expected party piece after a while. He thought it very funny <laughs> to piss out of his attic window at night onto the street below. He thought it very funny and he'd yell to people that reprimanded him, the Yiddish landlord should install a wash basin for me to use. Did not our Lord Jesus say unto the hippies, I was bursting and thou verily gave unto me an open window for mine usage. <clears throat> Dutch was an excellent painter in oils, but he never had money for paint. His realistic three flies on a dead fish live in my memory even to today. We sold it one hot day for the price of four beers and it was hung on the wall of the Newcastle Hotel in George Street where only good art was hung. Dutch was considered uncool by most hippies. The more uncool you became, the less pads would let you in. We often tried to outdo each other playing shock the squares. Dutch won by being the first butch-looking bloke to wear a house frock around King's Cross in the daytime. He didn't try to look feminine. In fact, with a beard and hobnail boots and hairy legs, he looked insane. He'd stride around marching goose step. That dress attracted too much attention and provoked violence in the street, so I stayed away until he gave it up. All right, that's all for tonight. I'm picking things out at random. Some of them are not that entertaining, but, you know, no one else is posting anything at the moment, so fuck, why not? All right. Oh, fuck, I forgot to have a cigarette. <laughs> oh, 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 I must be going cold turkey. Yeah, I never discovered any sort of drugs until I was 22 years old. So, and I think that was good because I started late. But that's a whole other story. So that's all for now.